All right, Revelation chapter number 13. And I'd like to begin reading in verse number 15 in order to kind of cover the, the topic that we want to cover. We've really finished the chapter, but there's one remaining thing that I'd like to go over with you about uh, uh, that's really a popular misconception about the passage. Uh, Revelation 13, verse 15. And he had power to give life into the image, talking about the false prophet now. And he had power to give life into the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and on, or in their foreheads, that no man should buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Now you'll notice that, um, that the issue in the passage about the mark of the beast, in verse number uh, 15, it's, it's a, he, he's going to cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be, that, that'd be killed. Verse 16, and he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and, or in their forehead. So the mark of the beast, everybody has to take the mark of the beast. And it's interesting that they either have to take it in their forehead or in their right hand. And there's a great deal of symbolism there. Uh, it didn't, uh, the other night I was watching a, a television show and I thought, wow, that's interesting because I'm not really up on the, uh, uh, the, the systems of, of the religious system in, in, in some ways uh, so that it jumps out in my mind. But I was watching uh, the show uh, All in the Family. You, you remember that show. And they, they have reruns on, the, on the, uh, one of the Chicago, it's either 50 or 60 or something like that, uh, at night, uh, about 11.30 every night. And my wife and I watch that almost every night during the week. We, it, it is, it's, it's screwy that you'd like a show so much that you'd stay up that late. We're always up that late. But uh, that, I can laugh harder at that show than any show I know of anywhere on TV. It tells you the kind of quality TV that I watch, that, that my favorite show is a Magnum P.I. and All in the Family. You know? <laughs> and uh, my favorite person on All in the Family is Edith. That woman can say more with her face than, uh, and, and I had some relatives that she reminds me of, so I enjoy the show a lot. <laughs> but anyway, the other night uh, Archie wanted to have his grandson, the, the, the uh, meathead and Gloria's little baby, uh, wanted to have the baby baptized. And of course, his son-in-law, I don't remember his name, Meathead's all I can remember. And that's not nice to call him that, but uh, Mike. Mike, Mike, is that his name? Whatever. Mike Stivick. Mike Stivick. Okay, Stivick. Okay, that's it. Uh, see, I, I, it didn't, didn't even sound right to me. Mike uh, and Gloria's little boy, and of course, of course, Mike on the show is an atheist, and uh, and Archie is, you know, he's a flaming, flaming Protestant. You know, he, he's 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 everything bad and evil that the world wants you to think about Protestants. You know, they're just dumb and stupid and thumping around, don't know what they're talking about. But he was gonna, he was gonna connive and get this boy baptized. And so he took him down to the church and, and Reverend Fletcher or whatever, Felcher, you know, it's Fletcher, oh, no, that's Felcher, whatever. They, you know, the routine they go to every time he says his name. And they go through that, and this other pre, uh, priest there wouldn't, wouldn't baptize him because his mom and dad didn't want him to. And so Archie steals away into where the baptis, baptism, baptismal pool is. And, and it's obviously a, a, and he's a Protestant because he's always kicking the, the next door neighbor that's a Catholic, but it's obviously a, a, a Catholic-oriented Protestant church because it's got this little round circular room like they have in a Roman church with a baptismal fount in it. And he goes in and he's going to baptize the baby. And he's got the little guy in his arms and he reaches in and he sticks his thumb into the baptistry and pulls out the water and he makes an X <laughs> on his forehead. And I got to thinking, I, and, and I was watching that. And he took that thing and he says, I baptize thee, little baby, right, right, you know, an X. Of course, it's supposed to be a cross, but a cross is an X. I baptize the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And Lord, I hope this takes, you know, and all that stuff. But I got to thinking about it. You know, that's interesting because the mark of baptismal consecration is taken in the forehead. And I thought of this passage. You know where that mark of the beast is taken? Right there in the forehead. 
And I tried to show you that the mark of the beast, as we studied it, is a, is a mark that is received in a religious ceremony. And I don't know, I wouldn't go so far to say that it was done in a baptism ceremony, but you know, we talk about somebody getting initiated into a job or initiated into something and we call it a baptism of fire. You ever heard that? Somebody goes to the job and they have a real hard day and they really find out what the job's really about and we call that a baptism of fire. That's a common expression out in the world. And uh, that, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the initiation rite of this, of this thing, when, when they get that black mark stuck on their forehead up there, and then in the hand, that's that pledge of fellowship and, 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 and communion in the hand, they take the mark there. So the symbolism's real great about that mark. And I got thinking about that and thinking, boy, you know, you could really do something with that because uh, uh, those things, you know, they begin to work in your mind. Because uh, the satanic policy of evil, when, when, when God interrupted the prophetic program with the dispensation of grace, and He set aside the nation Israel, and He set Israel's program aside, and Israel's commission aside, and Israel's baptism aside, and Israel's, all of Israel's things aside, and introduced something new. You know something, folks? The, the religious system picked up the things God set aside back there and practices them today. And the religious system out there is built on, on, the, on the, the, the uh, point of view of trying to convince you that you're Israel and that you ought to obey Israel's program and Israel's ceremonies and Israel's uh, 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 operating procedures and all the rest. And when you go out there and say, no, we're not Israel, we're the body of Christ, and Israel's hope is not our hope, and Israel's commission is not our commission, and Israel's ceremonies are not our ceremonies, you know what happens to you. You look like a, you know, a real nitwit out there in the world, which is the way you ought to look to the world, of course. But you understand who picked that stuff up and is carrying it on. Little wonder that it'll culminate out there in the religion of the Antichrist, Baal worship. Now, involved in that mark of the beast here, is, is the issue in verse number 16 that he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor and so forth, to take the mark of the beast. Now, the question immediately arises, and, and the assumption is generally made, that the Antichrist is, is going to reign over all of the planet Earth and over every nation, and over every kindred, and over every tongue, and that everybody in every nation in the earth is going to have to submit to the Antichrist, and that he's going to rule over every kindred, and every tongue, and every nation in the earth. Therefore, every person on the earth is going to have to make a choice to either take the mark of the beast or not take the mark of the beast. And so you have preachers today going all over Chicago and all over the United States and all over Western Europe and all over Eastern Europe and all over South America and, and preaching and warning people that you better watch out not to take the mark of the beast, that your credit card's got these little numbers on it and that's the mark of the beast and that at the supermarket, the little lines on the scanner is just another way to set you up to put the tattoo in your forehead and all of that and, and the sensationalism just goes everywhere try to, with the assumption being that everybody is going to face this issue of whether you're going to have to take the mark of the beast because, because he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark in their forehead, and anybody that doesn't have the mark can't buy or sell. And I, when I get to thinking about that, in other words, the Antichrist is going to be this worldwide dictator, and that the United States and every other nation on the earth is going to bow to his supremacy and is going to be under his rulership and the laws and the regulations that he and the decrees that he sends forth are going to have to be submitted to by every nation and every person in the earth. As I study my Bible, I find out that that isn't the case. When I study my Bible and I find out what the Bible teaches about the extent of the government of the Antichrist, where when he makes a law, that law has to be obeyed, that the extent of the government of the Antichrist does not extend to every nation, every kindred, and every tongue in the earth. It does not extend to the United States. It does not extend to Brazil. It does not extend to Canada. It does not extend to, to England and, and to Germany and to France and, and to uh, uh, South Africa and, and wherever, you think, you know, Kenya and where, whatever you think of some countries in, in Africa and so forth. 
Central and South Africa. It doesn't extend to Australia. There are all kinds of nations in the earth where it doesn't go when I begin to study the Bible. And yet I know that if, when I say that, people immediately get a, get a little askance and a little askew about what's going on. They say, whoa, wait a minute, because the assumption has always been made that when he said in verse 16, for example, and there are other passages like this, that he caused all, both small and great, to receive the mark, that all there meant everybody on the planet. But that isn't necessarily the case. And I'm going to give you three or four reasons in a minute why it's, it's obvious and clear when you begin to study prophecy that the Antichrist reign, does not, his government does not extend to, to every nation in the earth. Because in chapter 13 itself of Revelation, you have already been told what the extent of his government is. And it isn't to all the earth. But you say, then, if that's true, then what is the all, both small and great, what does that all mean there? Well, come back with me to Genesis, and let me show you how this word all is used in the Bible. The word all is used over and over as a reference to all that the verse and the context has in mind. It doesn't necessarily mean every single thing outside of what the context has in mind. For example, Genesis chapter number 6, verse number 17. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under the heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. Now, did, did everything that had breath in it die in the flood? Well, no. You know it didn't. Where did some things, that, some people and some creatures that had breath in them, where did, they, where, where did they survive? In the ark. So when he says that all, uh, wherein is the breath of life, and to destroy all flesh, that's, that's all the flesh that he's talking about, all the flesh that has corrupted itself before God, all the flesh that he has in mind as being the subject of what he's talking about. In other words, it's not just a blanket statement of everything. There's a context that identifies all of what? All that God has in mind in the passage. Uh, let me show you another one. Come with me to Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. Verse number 21 but that you also may know my affairs and how I do, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known unto you all things. Now, did Tychicus tell Paul what time our service tonight was going to be? Ephesians 6, 21. Well, you know he didn't. I mean, you weren't even a bad dream to Tychicus. He never even thought about you. Never dreamed uh, something 2,000 years after his time. Well, the verse says he's going to make known to you all things. But you, when you read that, you immediately know that he isn't talking about telling you what kind of automobile you were going to drive to Shorewood Bible Church in 1992. You know that. What was he talking about? All things about what Paul's doing. Uh, he's going to make you know, the verse says, but that you also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus is going to declare all things to you. All what things, Paul? All the things Paul's got in mind, what he's talking about here, all of his affairs. All of the things that Paul's doing. And yet is he, is he going to tell them Paul's hat-bound size? No, it isn't absolutely everything even about Paul. But what he's going to do is going to bring them up to date in, uh, on, on all the things that are going on in Paul's current ministry. The word all is, has to be modified and understood by the context in which it's being talked about. And that's true when you talk about government and who, who is being reigned over. Come with me to Daniel chapter number 2. And we could go through another half dozen verses. I, I wrote down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I wrote down 18 references here. I'm not going to look at any more of them with you, but... Uh, and I wrote those down out of my mind, just my feeble little memory. 
uh, last night try, when I was thinking about this to make me some notes to try to guide what I'm doing. And the idea is that all is always limited or defined by all of what? All of what the verse or the context is talking about. So the word all, it includes all that's in the mind of what's being talked about in the verse. Daniel chapter number 2, verse number 37. Nebuchadnezzar's had this big dream of this image. Daniel is going to, he tells him in verse 36, this is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Nebuchadnezzar was smart. <laughs> he says, I, I'm not going to tell it. I got this dream and it bothers me and I want to know what it means. So I want, I want my magicians and my religious muckety-mucks, I want you guys first to tell me what the dream was and then two to tell me the interpretation. They said, whoa, wait a minute. You tell us the dream, then we'll tell, tell you the interpretation. They said, nope, I'm not giving you any. I want to know for sure that I get the right answer, so you tell me the dream too. And they said, ah, oh, we can't do that. And so in comes Daniel. So Daniel says, well, you know, there's a God in heaven. He, God, God knows what your thoughts were. He gave you the dream. He can tell you. And so Daniel tells him the dream. Well, you know, if you could read the guy's mind and tell him the dream, then, then he's confident that Daniel's going to be right. Now he's going to give him the interpretation. Verse 37, Thou, O king, this will be Nebuchadnezzar, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom and power and strength and glory. And, where, and, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowl of heaven, hath he given into thy hands, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Now, Babylon has spread itself out in, in, into the empire. But let me tell you something, folks. There were people in Greece and in Rome and in Europe at the time that this was written that never saw or heard of, ba of, of Babylon or Nebuchadnezzar. When he says there in verse number 37, 38, that thou hast given him into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. That's not a reference to every single human that is living on the earth at that time because there were many people living on the earth at that time that Nebuchadnezzar did not rule over. But the, the extent to which his kingdom went, everyone in the confines of where his kingdom went, he ruled all of them. It was a a statement of where your kingdom goes and the men that dwell where your kingdom extends and where you seek to extend it. Those people are all ruled over by you. And after thee, verse 39, shall another kingdom inferior arise, another kingdom inferior to thee, and another kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth. That's Greece. Babylon, then Media Persia, then Greece. And yet if you know your history books, you know that, that even Alexander the Great never ruled over every single human that walked the face of the earth. He never, he never ruled over the Aztecs who lived about the same, you know, they, they were supposed to, their ancestors were, were living. He never, you understand what I'm saying? It's a relative expression, see? It's talking about where his kingdom went. When his kingdom ex extended itself out toward India, he ruled over everybody where it went. So even in the, even in the statements of the government involved in, these, in, in, in places like Daniel here, it isn't that it's just a, a worldwide kingdom because Babylon wasn't. Get, get a history book out and look at the confines of it and then look at the people that were outside. In fact, the, the, the Medes and the Persians were outside the domain of the Babylon, Babylonians because they came in and conquered Babylon from outside. And the Greeks were outside the Medes and the Persians and they came in and conquered the Greeks and the Romans were outside of them and conquered them. So when you go back to Revelation 13, my point to you is that when he says, talks about all there, the all is modified by the context. And the all, kindreds, tongues, and nations, and men, that the Antichrist is going to rule over is the all that's in the context of Revelation 13. And we have identified for you, and I, I, I'm not going to do it all again tonight, but I've tried to show you carefully as we've gone through this passage that the Antichrist kingdom in Revelation chapter 13 
is, 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 is a kingdom of, is a ten confederated king, kingdom. A kingdom of ten confederated nations and kingdoms that are formed inside of the old Roman Empire. Rather than it being the revived Roman Empire, which is what all the preachers are telling you on the television today. That's how they get Europe and the European common market and, and all that stuff that's going on over there. And you mark my words, this is December 20th, 1992, you mark my words that that, that stuff over there is going to fall apart before it comes together. I'm talking about the European common market and the, European, the EC and all that business. It's already falling apart over there. The emphasis behind having a united Europe and getting the French to work along with anybody else or the Germans to work with the, the Dutch and the Dutch to work with the British and the British to work with anybody else. The, the impetus behind that was the, 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 the communist bloc and the threat over there. And now that all that's down and gone, the motor driving all that stuff is going and they're just coasting now. And rather than it being the, the end time prophetic movings toward the rise of the man of sin, it's just the natural course of the world following its own economic and political interest, which is exactly what you'd think it would do. Now, instead of there being the revival of the old Roman Empire, there is a part of the old Roman Empire that, it, that is going to be revived. It will be a revision of the old Roman Empire. And if you'll just put down in your mind Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, where we went through that study back, in fact, chapter 13, verse number, number 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw the, a beast rise up out of, the, out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the names of blasphemy. Now you'll remember our studies in chapter 13, verse number 1, where we saw that those ten horns and those ten crowns is, is, is that ten confederated kingdom that comes out of one of the divisions of the Greek Empire in Daniel chapter 8, over which the Antichrist gains ascendancy. And the Antichrist kingdom and his government and his authority and his ability to make a law and to have a decree that must be obeyed extends to that ten confederated kingdom that, that shows up. And here's, here's a real rough map of, that, that I was using for something else, but it shows up in this territory of the world right in here. And this area in here from North Africa around through Persia and uh, 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 Arabia and Persia and on up into Turkey and up into this area right in here. That's where these ten kingdoms will arise. And when those ten kingdoms arise in this area, and you've seen in the last year to two how quickly things, nations can disappear. It took overnight, two days, and Kuwait was gone. And only the, the economic interests of the Western world caused them to put it back on the map. But by the way, that country right there, see how jagged those borders? You know, what, you know who drew those borders? They drew those borders after World War I. And the British did that. And they draw, the, these, these borders in here are quite artificial today. And they're not very natural. Iraq and all the fighting that they're doing there with the Kurds and all that kind of stuff. The, 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 the natural divisions of where these nations would be isn't what's politically there now. And those things can change instantly, overnight, in just a few weeks and months. And there's going to be a tremendous political upheaval in this part of the world. And out of all this mess and conglomeration in here, ten nations are going to arise. And those ten nations then are going to be overtaken by one ruler who is going to unite them into a, a confederated kingdom with him at the head. And that man will be the Antichrist. And we've studied all that. That's what his kingdom is about. That's where his reign is. You leave the, if you leave the church here tonight, 
and you drive out here on Harlem Avenue and you go, go north, you'll cross over into Norwich. You go on north of there, you go up into Park Ridge. And every time you go from one little municipality to another little municipality, you go out Irving Park and you go through, through you can go to Norwich on one side and Chicago on the other, then you get to Shiller Park, then you get to Bensonville, then you get to Itasca, and then you get to Wooddale, and you get to Roselle, and just go right on out out there. And every little town, you know, every little town's got its own rules and regulations. They got their own police department. And if you're going through Shiller Park, Chicago policemen isn't going to stop and give you a speeding ticket. You know who's going to give you that? Shiller Park policemen. I mean, there is a, a boundary in which their jurisdiction is exercised. If the, if the Congress of the United States makes a decree and says you have to pay 28% or 32% or 50% of your income, anything you make and, and, and any, any income you make, and, and they pass the law, you don't have to pay. You know somebody in Brazil or Bolivia or Germany doesn't have to worry about ship, shipping that much of their income off to the U United States Internal Revenue Service. You know why? Because the laws made here don't apply to people over yonder. When the Antichrist and his kingdom begins to pass these regulations and these rules and these requirements. Folks, it's going to be the extent of his kingdom that these rules and regulations and requirements cover. And his kingdom, in the passage, in the context, over and over, I've tried to show you, is that ten confederated king, nation kingdom. And the, the nation, the kindred, the people, the tongues that are involved are in that ten confederated nation kingdom, not all the world. Now, how do you know that when you study the Bible? Well, first of all, the Antichrist reign will reign, he'll only reign over that, that ten nation kingdom formed inside the old Roman Empire. And only these kingdoms will, will give their power to him and, and, and form his rule and his reign. Only those. The United States never was in the old Roman Empire. We won't qualify to be one of them. But there, there are other passages. For example, come back with me to Daniel chapter 11. There are many nations in, in, that are described in the Bible that escape, that are clearly said to escape taking the mark of the beast. Every nation in the earth does not take the mark. Daniel chapter number 11, verse number 40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, and with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow, and pass over. And he shall enter into the glorious land, it's the land of Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall, you see that next word, escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. That's the territory of roughly uh, of Jordan today, and some south of Jordan. Those countries right there on the, on the eastern side of the Jordan River over there, the Antichrist is coming in, entering into Jerusalem, entering to, in, into Israel, into the glorious land, and they're battling, and they're fighting, and there are nations right there in, at his doorsteps who escape out of his hand. Well, folks, if a nation right at, at his doorsteps shall escape, well, then somebody across an ocean won't have much problem either. Verse 42, he, he, he shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans, and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. See, uh, Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make, to, to make away many. Folks, if he's ruling over everybody and everybody is being in submission to him, who in the world are these people in the east and in the north that are fighting against him? And we're not in the beginning of the week here. We're way over into the week, into the seventh week in Daniel 11. Come with me to Zechariah chapter 14. 
Obviously, there are people in the tribulation who aren't in submission to him, who aren't under his governmental control and authority, who are fighting nations who are fighting against him. Zechariah chapter 14, verse number 16. Uh, the second advent of Jesus Christ is what you find in Zechariah. Verse number 1, 2, 3, 4, you have the second advent. Verse 3, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as he fought in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day. Uh, in, uh, upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem. Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 1 verse 11, uh, He goes away and the angel says to Peter and, and, and the apostles, Why stand you gazing into heaven? This same Jesus that you see go away shall in like manner come back. His feet left this planet from the Mount of Olives. The next time His feet touch this planet, it's in that verse right there, and they'll touch on the Mount of Olives. Now He'll have fought all over Palestine, up in Damascus, down in the, in, into the Sinai Peninsula, down toward Egypt, he will have been fighting uh, for, for uh, a couple of days by the time he gets here. But he's going to come up from Sinai, up the king's highway like Israel did when they came out of the wilderness, go across on the eastern side of the Dead Sea, cross the Jordan River where John the Baptist baptized Christ, where Israel crossed the Jordan River in, in the book of Joshua, go right across there and, and go over, the, over to the Mount of Olives and step off that white charger right there on the Mount of Olives looking down out over Jerusalem. And when he does, the pastor says that the mountain's going to cleave and be a great earthquake and so on and so forth. Verse number 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. There shall be one Lord and His name one. The context is the millennium, the kingdom. Now verse number 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 talks about the judgment that's going to take place uh, on men uh, who have re resisted Him. Verse 16, It shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the, Lord, the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. By the way, if you wanted to date the second advent of Jesus Christ, you would date it by the Feast of Tabernacles. You wouldn't date it by, by, by when you think maybe the Antichrist showed up and the rapture is going to show up and all that stuff because you can't date the rapture. But there is a, there is a, a, a system of, of typology in your Bible about the second advent of Christ that focuses around the tabernacle, the Feast of Tabernacles rather. And that, that's the, in the context here, that's what's happening. The Feast of Tabernacles is the beginning of the millennium. And you notice the verse says, It shall come to pass that every one that is left of all nations which came against Jerusalem. Now look at here. If all the nations that came up against Jerusalem had taken the mark of the beast, what would have happened to them? That would have been destroyed, wouldn't they? Isn't that what Revelation chapter 14 says? That everyone that took the mark is going to be cast out into, in, in, into hell, in, in, into the torment, into the, in, into the fire that never... They'll all be cast out into hell. And yet here are some people from the nations that come up against Jerusalem that are in the millennium. And did they go in the millennium with the mark of the beast on them? No. Then there are some of the nations that come up in, in conjunction with the Antichrist against Jerusalem, and yet they aren't taking the mark of the beast. They are in cooperation with him, but they are not under his direct decree and authority. The people that he can tell what to do are the people in that ten nation kingdom over which he rules. All those other nations come and cooperate with him for economic and political advantage. Many of them will submit and, and will, will perhaps take the mark of the beast, but it isn't the decree in their land that is required of them as it is over here in the Antichrist kingdom. So there's a difference in there. Come with me to Matthew chapter 25. Certain nations escape the rule of the Antichrist. And he can't tell people what to do and require them to take the mark and so forth lest, and, unless they could buy or sell unless he rules over them. And it is very clear that there are nations in the earth who escape his rule during the 70th week of Daniel. Matthew 25, verse number 31, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, 
and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate the one from the other, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on, uh, on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For when I, I was hungry, and you gave me meat, I was thirsty, and you gave me drink, I was a stranger, and you took me in naked, and you clothed me, I was sick, and you visited me, I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? Or when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in and naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison or came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, Israel, you, you have done it unto me. There is a bunch of Gentiles that are invited, welcomed, and taken into the kingdom out of the tribulation period where Israel is suffering a wreck and havoc and torment and persecution and they're hungry and they're thirsting and they're being persecuted and they're naked and they have all these calamities upon them. And there are some Gentile nations at that time who bless Israel and because of it get the Abrahamic blessing of going into the kingdom. Why? Because they did it to one of the least of these, my brethren. And you'll notice that he, in verse 32, before him are gathered the nation, all nations. And he separates them one from another. The judgment of the nations at the beginning of the kingdom. To identify the nations that are left to go in. So there's, there, my point to you is that uh, there, are, there are nations that escape his rule. There are nations that make war with him. Daniel 11, Revelation 16. So what does that tell you? Well, what that tells you is that all of the nations of the earth are not going to be under his specific direct reign and rule and governmental authority. So every nation in the earth isn't going to be required to take the mark of the beast. Now listen to me. It'll help you. It'll help you shake out the dust of some of the sensationalism and the sensational prophecy preachers who come along and try to hoodwink you into being afraid of something that God Almighty's Word says you'll never face. Number one, because the rapture is going to take you out of here before. And number two, even if the rapture waited till the day before this guy sets up, you still aren't going to be directly affected with it in this, in this nation or in any of the other nations of the earth that are outside of that ten-nation kingdom that he forms in Daniel 7, and Revelation 17, and Revelation 13. So no, the Antichrist never will reign over the United States. The Antichrist never will reign over Western Europe and Eastern Europe. He never will reign over but just one small little piece of southeastern Europe. And uh, he, his, his, his mark and all the rest of those things, while being offered and allowing people to freely take of, if they will cooperate and participate with him, will only be commanded and required by his decree of those people that are under him under his government. And again, his government is defined for you in Revelation chapter 13 as being that ten horn kingdom that he sets up. So I hope you'll understand, folks, that there's, that there's some liberty for you from all this sensationalism, the things that, that, that could keep you from being hoodwinked are these kind of things, understanding the prophetic program clearly. So that rather than, than worrying about, listen, you want to worry about something, let me show you a verse to worry about. Look at Proverbs chapter 13, verse 13. See, I'll show you something to worry about. I, I mean, you want to worry, I'll give you something to worry about. Proverbs 13, verse 13. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed. But he that feareth the commandments shall be rewarded. You want to worry about what's going on in the world. There's never been a person, there's never been a nation 
who has despised the Word of God and not had the fate of that verse come upon them. Destruction. And I'll tell you something, folks. We live in a great nation, or what was a great nation. And it was the greatness of our, na of our country came from the liberty that was extended to its citizens because the Word of God was honored and preached and exalted. And even unsaved people were, 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 were uh, built up and edified by the impact of the Word of God. Even unsaved people had it culturally ingrained into their thinking. But all those foundations have been destroyed. And you don't prop up a house whose foundations have been sucked out from under it by putting up two by fours and trying to hold the walls together like the church, evangelicalism and fundamentalism has been doing the last 20 years. It doesn't work. What you better do is start moving the furniture out, get the family moved out, get the kids out, get anything that's any value to you out of it because the roof's fixing to fall in. You can't do to the Word of God what this nation has done to the Word of God and survive. It isn't possible. Now that doesn't mean, but you see, we live in the dispensation of grace. Thank God. And God isn't today going around pouring out His judgment on the world. America included. And so because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, the hearts of the sons of men being foolish are fully set in them to, to do evil. They think, well, God didn't just whack me, therefore he doesn't really care, and therefore I can despise his word, and therefore I can get away with it, and that's just foolishness. What you're building into, you, into your, your life is going to determine what you get out of your life. And what your nation builds into it, and the amount of sound doctrine and nation's thinking is going to determine whether, whether the nation is exalted or destroyed. Righteousness exalts a nation. And sin is a reproach to any people, destroys them. And what you need, the answer to it, folks, is not to stand out on a street corner and cry, here comes the, ju here comes the Antichrist, you know. And the answer is not to stand out there and scream and holler about the abortion clinics and about Bill Clinton getting elected for president or, or George Bush getting elected for president or, or somebody else getting elected over yonder or the, the, this or that. The answer isn't to scream and holler at all the woes in the world. The answer is to take the truth of God's Word that you have, the truth of His grace, and go out and share it with as many people and put it out as far as you can and get as many people saved as you can and then into the Word of God rightly divided because that's the only thing that's going to last through the calamity. Okay? So don't get caught up in, in trying to, to be, don't get caught up in all the things that, that are, are, are designed to divert your attention away. I got some material just last week from a, from a fine guy, fundamental evangelical TV preacher that's a good guy. He, he, He's sound in, in so many ways. And yet the whole of his, the whole mailing that I got, page after page of stuff, it's all about the coming collapse and how to miss the mark and how to do, it's all this sensationalism. And I keep looking through it and I keep thinking, you know, this guy knows some things that he could say that would really help someone. But you know what the problem with that is? It don't get the do re me in the mailings like the other stuff does. And uh, okay, fine. But you'd be, you be wiser than that, would you? And let's be, let's be busy getting the gospel, the grace of God out to others because that's where the answer is. And that's where the truth is. And folks, truth sets you free. It really does. So let's go, let's go be the Lord's free men and women and, uh, and get out and preach it and use our liberty. Use it wisely, not flaunt it, but the wise use of our liberty for His glory. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your goodness to us. We thank you for your word that prepares us and warns us and equips us that if we just believe what it says, it protects us. And I pray tonight as we go from this place, we'll go forth with a confidence 
that's based not in, in the dread of our enemy, but in the greatness of our God and the, His worthiness to be praised. And we'll thank you for it.